Hey, National Park Church, welcome to our virtual candlelight service. We're so glad that you've joined us for this time together as we've already got to experience uh, the beauty of the, um, the music that was played by Laura. Uh, and then I hope that that video that we just watched sets the tone for the rest of this evening where we're going to be worshiping, we're going to be reflecting upon, we're going to be reading scripture about this incredible king named Jesus. Uh, it's a really strange story, it's a unique story, but it's a beautiful story. And so I know that many of us come tonight with uh, stress because of the season that we're in. There's a lot of people that feel like life is completely hectic and crazy at this moment. And what we hope here at National Park is that for this time to feel like a, a, a time of reprieve, a time where we can breathe and just be present in the worship of Jesus for a few moments. So we got some awesome opportunities to sing. We, we're going to have our, as we've been talking about, our virtual candlelight uh, song where we're encouraging you to take pictures and videos of yourself participating in the candlelight portion of our service. Um, but this is going to be a time where we hope that you and your family can be intentional about worshiping the king that we're celebrating. The king who, as we're going to talk about and think about this evening, radically reshapes everything about the world as we know it. And so I want to begin with a, a prayer to start us off, and then we're going to dive in to an incredible opportunity to worship together. Let's pray. God, you are so good. And even as we're doing this, not in person, as many of us, including myself, really wish we could, we know that you're faithful and we know that you're with us. We are blown away by the fact that you loved us enough to enter into the world, to become a human being so that we might be healed. And God, we want to reflect the love that you show in your son, Jesus Christ, in our daily life. We want to be people that are so radically transformed by the story of your son that we become representatives of him in our daily lives. Thank you for our National Park family. Give us an opportunity for these next few moments to just be in your presence in a very real way. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies With angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Hail the heavenly Prince of Peace Hail the Son of Righteousness Light and light to all He brings Rinse with healing in His wings Christ my highest heaven adored Christ the everlasting Lord Come desire of nations come Fix in us thy humble home Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn I'll be reading from Isaiah 9, uh, verses 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, and the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, 
and will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. O holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and never pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn.
Hey everybody, so glad we could be together for this interactive candlelight service. So right now we're going to spend some time talking with our kids and our families, giving them some little activities to do and just engage with this candlelight service. So we're actually going to go outside in just a minute. So I'm going to go ahead and put on my hat just because it's, you know, it's cold outside. A uh, little snowflakes last night and that was fun, uh, but let's get get all warm and, and cozy. So again, we're so glad you're here. And as you can see on the table, there's some pretty familiar Christmas stuff, right? So you got Mary and Joseph, you've got the wise men, you've got the manger, and that's all exciting because we are waiting for these guys to get here and these guys to get here and this little guy to get here, but not yet. So I'm curious, when you think about Christmas time, what are you waiting for? Probably most of us are waiting for presents, right? Maybe you have your wish list, you've talked to your mom and dad, maybe you've talked to other people about something you like for Christmas, or you're waiting to give a present because you're excited. Maybe you made a present for someone you love or you went and bought a present for someone you love and you're excited and waiting to give that gift to them. Maybe you're waiting to spend time with family that you haven't seen in a long time. Maybe like me, you're waiting for those yummy cinnamon rolls or special breakfast on Christmas morning. But that's what Christmas is all about, waiting. That's what makes it so exciting. So we're going to talk about how a long time ago, the people of God, our old brothers and sisters from the church a long, long time ago, they were excited because they were waiting for someone to come. And that's right, that, is, that was Jesus. But they called him the Messiah. And he was going to be their king. So they were waiting. And when it came time for Jesus to come, where did he come from? Well, the Bible tells us that he was with God and he left heaven to come all the way here to be with us. So we're going to travel a little bit tonight. How far away is that? How far away is heaven? Is it a long way or a short way? Well, for God, he's powerful and so it doesn't take him too long. But if we think about where heaven is, perhaps it's really far away. So Jesus traveled all that way to come see us. Maybe it's as far as Disney World or as far away as the moon, but Jesus traveled a long way to see us. Actually, it's even farther than the moon. There's a star above the North Pole. It's the little dot on the Little Dipper called Polaris, or the North Star. And the North Star is really special, and it's really cool, because it looks like it's the only star in the sky that never really moves. Because where it's positioned in the sky, as the Earth turns, it seems like it just stays right there above the North Pole. But actually, it's very, very giant, and it's very, very far away. It's actually so far away, it's called 323 light years away. And it would take us, if we got on a rocket ship, it would take us over 12 million years to get there, if my math is correct. I'm not really great at math. I like reading and thinking and science, but I'm not so great at math sometimes. But that's a really long way. Even if it was just 1 million years, that's a long ways away. But 12 million years, that's a long way. But we know Jesus left heaven to come be with us a long ways away. So there's a lot of traveling in our story. Mary and Joseph traveled from their country, Nazareth, all the way to Bethlehem. We know they traveled with some donkeys and maybe they had some stuff with them. So how far do you think it took them to go from their hometown all the way to Bethlehem? It took them about 90 miles on a donkey. So 90 miles for us, we can get there like in an hour and a half. It'd be like going to 
uh, little rock or a little bit farther, not too far away. Maybe they were hungry and cranky and tired, kind of like I am when I go on a long trip. Have you ever been that way before? Mom, when do we get there? When do we get there? But it took them about 90 miles, about a week to get there. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days. Seven days, one week. That's kind of a long ways to travel, especially on a donkey. So, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little road trip for us right now. So, let's do a little bit of travel with our family. Young kids, big kids, everybody. And some of the big kids, you're probably saying, I don't want to do this. Let me help you with that a little bit. This is something you've never done before, so if you will stand up and do this with your family, it'll create a memory in your mind because you've never done it before. And so years from now, you will be able to remember, hey, remember when we did that candlelight service with National Park Church and we all went outside and did these little things? And it's going to stick in your memory. So I'm going to give you about 60 seconds to do this. And it's an easy travel for the first one. Remember seven days? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So how many steps does it take you to get to your bedroom? I'll give you 60 seconds. Ready, go. Okay, so how many steps did it take you to get there? Not 90 miles, not seven days. How many steps did it take you? Maybe 15, 25, but certainly not 90 miles. So Jesus' family, they traveled a long way for the story, and we have to travel a long way. Jesus traveled from heaven. Mary and Joseph traveled a long way, and sometimes we have to travel too to get close to Jesus. Sometimes our heart is far away and we want to get close to Jesus. So how many steps did it take you to get to your bedroom? And then think, how many steps does it take us to get to Jesus? Here's a quick hint. Sometimes we feel like it takes a long ways, but the truth is it only takes one step to get close to Jesus. So. Who else in our story had to travel a long ways? Hmm, yes, the three. Well, there was at least three because they had three gifts, but maybe there was more wise men than that. The three wise men and their camels, they're also called the Magi. And each of the Magi had special gifts to bring Jesus. Do you know what those gifts were? Maybe you can talk to them, to your family about them, or you can share that with someone else. Or if you don't know, ask mom and dad, what presents did the wise men give Jesus? So they had to travel a long ways too. How far did you think they have to travel? So they traveled from Egypt or the Babylonian area all the way to Bethlehem. Babylon to Bethlehem. About how long do you think that took? Because it was a long ways. It was actually almost a thousand miles. That's pretty far. But they wanted to go a thousand miles to bring their presence to Jesus. They had been reading in their books and in the old Bible about how Jesus would come to earth. They knew that he was going to be the Messiah, the King, the Promised One. And so they chose to travel all the way to see Jesus and bring him their presence. A thousand miles. How long would that take? 
well, depending how fast they went and how long their ca camels could travel, it could take three months, maybe six months, or if they had other journeys to go on, it could have taken even a year, because we do know they stopped sometimes to talk to Herod and see other people. They had to take care of their camels. So it took them a long ways to travel too. So let's travel again with our family. So we got to stand up. This time you will need to put on your warm clothes because we're going to go outside. I'm going to give you a little bit longer this time. How many steps does it take you to get to your mailbox? Ready, go. So, how many steps? Not a thousand miles, right? Maybe a hundred steps or 50 steps. I know some of you, your mailbox is probably a long ways away and maybe you had to get on your four-wheeler or get in your car to go down to your mailbox. And so maybe you could calculate how many miles it is. It is probably not very long with riding in a car. But for walking or on a camel, it feels like a really long ways away. So, Mary and Joseph about a week, the wise men about six months or maybe a year, Jesus all the way from heaven, and us one step closer to the king. So, how many steps? Well, for you, about a hundred steps or less to your mailbox. For the wise men, many, many steps. But they really wanted to see him, remember? Remember? Remember, they wanted to give him the presents. Many people were waiting for Jesus to come and be the king. Okay, the last thing we're going to do. Earlier, we talked about the North Star, how it was so far away, how it's the one star in the sky that seems like it doesn't move. It wasn't the Christmas star in Bethlehem, but it's one that we can find very easily if we go outside, look for the little dipper and the little dot on the end of the dipper, so, I'm going to give you a few minutes to go outside and do that. Ready, go.
So now that you're back, did you find the North Star? If it's cloudy outside, it was probably hard for you to find. But hopefully you saw the pictures of what the North Star looks like. And over the next few days, maybe even Christmas Eve, you'll go outside and you'll find the North Star and be reminded of the star in Bethlehem and how it pointed everybody toward the coming King Jesus. Look, he was born. He's here. And that's what everybody here was excited about. That's why they traveled so far away. Jesus traveled from heaven. Mary and Joseph traveled from their hometown to Bethlehem. The wise men traveled all the way to come see Jesus. And we, we travel however many steps it takes for our heart to get to Jesus. Do you remember how many steps it takes us? Sometimes it feels like a long way. But Jesus is always close to us, and so it only takes us one step to say, Jesus, I love you. You are my king. And just like all these guys here are worshiping Jesus, we can do the same thing. So, hope you are anticipating and waiting for your heart to draw close to Jesus, and we hope that happens right now. Merry Christmas. We love you guys. We hope you have a great night for a candlelight service and a great Christmas holiday. We probably won't see you again before then. So, Merry Christmas. We love you. I'm gonna take this hat off and get another hat and my Christmas tree snack because they're so good. Merry Christmas, everybody. Go holy Christmas. <laughs> Jesus laid down his sweet hair. The stars in the sky they looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky, they looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay. Close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care. And take us to heaven to live with thee there. In those days that a crew went out from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be one This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. When Quirinius was governor of Syria. Owen Then Joseph also went out from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he is in the house and lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed who was with Mary child. His betrothed who was with child. And Maria there, there that child came for her to get birth. came for her to get birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid, laid him in a manger because there is no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out the field watching the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the, the glory, glory of the Lord, Lord shone around them, and 
they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. Our great joy. That will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. 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 And on earth, earth. peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste to follow Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard wondered what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising, and praising God. God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. Amen. Many of the passages that we've read tonight, many of the songs that we've sung tonight are very familiar to most of us. Many of us uh, have sung them since we were this big and we've heard these verses. Even if we couldn't have told you exactly what place they were found in Scripture, we knew the story of Jesus' birth. We knew uh, the, the complications that came with them having a census in Bethlehem and Mary and Joseph having to go there and then not having a place for Jesus in an inn. Many of us have heard the story of the shepherds uh, with their flocks, and then all of a sudden these angels of the Lord come and announce this incredible reality that the, the king has come. 
Many of us have heard the descriptions of Jesus that, we, that Luke read for us. But I think it's really important for us to spend a little bit of time reflecting on what are we actually saying and what are these stories actually teaching us. At the beginning of what was read for us from the Gospel of Luke, it's important for us to note that at the beginning, Luke is setting up the stage where we are introduced to a figure during the first century, Caesar Augustus, who would have been very much seen as a kingly figure. This, this is a man who ruled the world at this time in history. That the very act of being able to call a census was an act of power because the reason a Caesar would call for a census is that he wanted to tax the people. He wanted to say, I have this authority and I have this power. And so if you lived in the ancient world, you would expect that some description is about to take place about Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus is a worthy figure for us to reflect upon because he's powerful and he's wealthy and he's influential. It would have been no surprise if there was a description about this kingly fig- figure. Maybe later on where Herod is described as the, the Jewish king, he represents a person of affluence and power and significance, maybe not to the, the extent that Caesar Augustus is, but still a person of prominence. But Luke wants to tell us a story about a king who arrives in a deeply unexpected way. And I think because we're so familiar with the story, we're often very comfortable with the peculiarity of how Jesus arrives, how this king arrives, and the fact that Luke is claiming that we're talking about a king here. And I love the way that C.S. Lewis interprets what's taking place here. He gives at least me an interpretation that opens up some beautiful possibilities to think of why is it that God shows up in this way? Why does God show up as this humble, uh, not prominent figure? Why does God show up in the form of coming to this family that has no uh, significant social standing? Why does God come and and is born not in a palace, but in a stable? This is what C.S. Lewis says. God entered into our human condition quietly as a baby born in obscurity because he had to slip covertly behind enemy lines. And then he continues, enemy-occupied territory, that is what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say landed in disguise and is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. I love that description because what he's saying is it is a disguise because when we look at the story, when we when we start to ponder the fact that Luke is describing Jesus as a king, not just any other king, but as the angels will say, the prince of peace, the one who is bringing peace for the entire world, it is not obvious on the surface that that has taken place. Nobody on the night of Jesus' birth would have known for certain, other than the announcement by the angels and the signs that were given to other people, that this is the king of the world. If anything, it seems like just another birth of an unimportant person. But what Lewis is telling us is actually what is taking place is a disguise that under the guise of humility and simplicity, the king of the universe is slipping into the world. Now, I think it's really important to note that when Lewis says that um, the occupied territory or the enemy occupied territory is the world, that he's not talking about God's good creation. He's not saying that this world is inherently bad. What Lewis is talking about is there's a kind of way of being in the world that are rep- represented by Caesar and represented by King Herod of power and might and influence and significance that are going to be turned upside down by this king. That this king is going to show us a different way to live. This king is going to show us the, a way in which we need to prioritize ourselves that is different than the way the world tells us. And he, the way he does that is not by coming in splendor and in royalty, and he doesn't do it by, like the Romans would have brought peace by coercion. This king is going to come 
and bring peace by conversion, to invite people into a new way of being. And what Lewis says is, you and I get to participate in that way of being in the world. That as we choose to follow this king, this strange king, the king who does not command armies upon armies, this king who does not sit in a beautiful palace, this king who refuses to destroy his enemy but decides to love his enemies, this king who chooses to love even the people that have been seen as outcast and insignificant, this king invites us to participate in a life that reflects the kind of kingdom that he came to bring about. This Christmas season is a beautiful time of celebration. It's a beautiful time to be with family. But do not over-sentimentalize this experience. This moment is a revolution. When the baby Jesus enters into the world, the world is turned upside down. And the invitation for us today is, are you going to participate in that revolution? As Lewis would call it, are you going to participate in that sabotage? Not violently, no, not coercively, but in the same manner that Jesus did. By living a compelling life that says the way of love, the way of compassion, the way of seeking the good of others is a way that extends and brings life to this dying and hurting and broken world. That the church, even now as we continue to follow this king, not the dominant powers of the world, not the people of greatest significance, but to follow the king that chose humility rather than honor, that chose the place of ser servanthood rather than the places of being served. If we follow that king, we proclaim not only with our singing, not only with our sermons, not only with our speech, but with our lives, that we are following a different kind of king. National Park, it is a beautiful gift to follow this strange and peculiar king. And my invitation to you is do not fall into the trap of over-sentimentalizing or falling in the trap of turning Jesus into the image of Caesar Augustus or Herod, but allow his strange, unique, upside-down kingdom to shape the way that you live, the way that you act, and the way that you engage with one another. Let's pray. God, give us the courage to live into this strange and peculiar kingdom. Help us to live our lives that reflect that we really do follow this king. Not the king who sits in a palace, not the king who ha commands thousands upon thousands in his army, not the king who goes and kills young innocent children because he feels threatened that another king might be coming in and challenging his throne. But we live like the king who would rather lay down his life than to destroy his enemy. That we see a king who sees individuals who have been forgotten about, and he sees their infinite value because they're made in the image of God. Who touches lepers. Who weeps with people that are weeping. Help us to live in that kingdom. God, we can only do that through your spirit. And we ask for your spirit to come. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. So here's the, the part of the service where we get to all participate in an active way together. We're going to sing Silent Night, and what we want you to do is get your candles ready, light your candles, and as we said at the beginning, and as we've said, as we've sent out kind of announcements about this evening, uh, we encourage you to take a picture of yourself, maybe take a video of yourself or your family participating in this moment of worship. And, and, and the reason we want to do this is we think it's really important for us to stay connected with one another. And 2020 has been a really hard year for many of us because we haven't had that connectivity. And I know it may seem trivial and insignificant, but I think just sharing our worship experiences with one another can be a beautiful gift to our church family. So what we want you to do right now is get your candles lit um, uh, and, and then make, be intentional about taking a picture of yourself and participating in this beautiful moment where we get to, to worship as the body of Christ.
So hope you'll do that. Uh, join in singing Silent Night with the National Park family. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child. Once again, we're thankful that we were able to spend time together. We hope you and your loved ones were blessed by this time, drawing close together, close to the light of Jesus as he comes into the world. As we leave tonight, we pray that each one of us will go forth with the understanding and the belief that we are part of something bigger, part of this magnificent blessing that Jesus came into the world. And as he came into the world, he decided to enter into our lives forever. So we take this light, we hold it dear, and we take it into the world. May we love those around us. May we seek those far from us. And may we take steps closer to Jesus. Blessings to you all, and Merry Christmas. <laughs>